I'm Cindy Kelly. It's Monday, March 14, 2016. We're in Washington, D.C., and I have with me the author, uh, J. Samuel Walker. And my first question to him is to tell me his name and to spell it. Well, my name is his first initial J, Samuel Walker, so it's J period S A M U E L W A L K E R. But I go by Sam. S A M. Um, well, I know that he is a noted author of the Manhattan Project, and that's why he's here today. But I wanted him just to give a nutshell summary of, of um, how he came to write about the Manhattan Project, what his career has been and his education? Uh, well, I'm trained as a historian. I have a PhD in history from the University of Maryland. My field uh, in graduate school was American diplomatic history. And uh, like many of my colleagues who got PhDs in the early 1970s, I couldn't find an academic job. Uh, I got a job at the National Archives and worked there for three and a half years. And I maintained my interest and did some some publishing in diplomatic history, but not on the atomic bomb. It wasn't uh, a topic that greatly interested me at that juncture. Uh, I had read Gar Alperovitz's book as an undergraduate and found that fascinating because it was, uh, it, it took issue with all the great, uh, or, or with the myth which had prevailed throughout the 50s and 60s that Truman had to use the bomb uh, because the only alternative was an invasion of Japan uh, that would have cost hundreds of thousands of lives. But so, so I read that and I thought, well, that's really interesting, and then, and then I, I, I moved on. Um, when I left the archives, I became the historian of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, or a historian at that time, and, and later the only historian for the NRC, where I wrote a bunch of books on nuclear power regulation, um, which again had nothing to do with the atomic bomb, except that I would get phone calls and people would, would, would call me up and say, um, you know, was the uh, first bomb used on Hiroshima a plutonium or a uranium bomb? And I, I didn't know. <laughs> and, and there were other questions like that. And, and people would call the NRC because the first name in the agency's title was nuclear. And so they assumed that, you know, the historian of the NRC would know. So I was kind of embarrassed by that. So I did some reading. And uh, that was around the time of the 40th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And a lot of very interesting books came out. Um, and I thought, well, I'd like to catch up on this topic. It's been 20 years since I was an undergraduate, almost 20 years. So I think I'll do some reading and find out more about this topic. And, and as I read, I got interested. And I, I wrote an article, uh, which was published in Journal Diplomatic History in, in 1989 or 90, uh, where I surveyed the literature on, on the atomic bomb and I drew some conclusions. And, and, and the article went over well and got, at least by the standard, my standards for scholarly articles, got more attention than, than other articles I had written. Um, so that's how I got into the topic. Um, and uh, so I got very interested. And I got even more interested when the um, huge controversy broke out a few years later in the, in the early 1990s, 93, 94, 95, over the Smithsonian's plan for um, it, its ill-fated Enola Gay exhibit. Uh, but the controversy was fascinating, but it was also a little disarming for me because the historiographical article that I'd written and published a, a few years, a couple of years earlier, constantly got quoted, usually out of context, uh, and oftentimes by scholars on the left side of the spectrum on the, uh, or in, in the atomic bomb controversy saying, uh, quoting me out of context and saying, look, you know, even the conservative official historian of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission agrees with me. Uh, and that really annoyed me, really, really annoyed me because I thought it was unprofessional. I still think it's unprofessional. And so at that point, this is 1995 now, uh, I thought, well, maybe um, I'll, I'll write a book. Because I thought there was a, a need for a short book on, um, on, on the decision to use the bomb that would appeal to um, students and the general public. So my objective was to, uh, was to outline my own views of why Truman used the bomb, which I hadn't, uh, hadn't, I, I hadn't reached any conclusions yet. Um, I wasn't certain, so, so I truly went into this topic with, with an open mind about, 
about why the bomb was used and what the considerations were, and, and most of all what the context was in the summer of 1945. Uh, and so I wanted to write a short book and I wanted to, to draw some conclusions and see where I came out. Uh, and that's how, how the book, Prompt and Utter Destruction, came about. Um, so, so partly I was out of peak on my part because I was tired of being quoted out of context and being quoted, this, this work was not done or not related in any way to my job at the NRC. Um, and, and it bothered me that people were, were, were using uh, my position as a government historian uh, to advance their own arguments or their own political position. Um, so, um, so for those two motivations, one of which is more noble than the other, uh, but, but I, I wrote that book evenings and weekends. I was working all day writing the history of nuclear power um, regulation. Uh, evenings and weekends. One winter, I, I wrote Prompt and Utter Destruction. And once I get into it, the topic is just, it, it doesn't let go. I, I mean, it's so fascinating uh, and so interesting. And, and, and new documents were opening after the death of Hirohito, so new books were coming out. So, um, so since I started that book 20 years ago, um, I, I've been an a atomic bomb decision junkie. <laughs> That's great. Well, <clears throat> I want you to pretend that I am 13 years old in the middle of the country and know nothing, you know, about the World War II or, you know, President Truman or the context of the decision to drop the bomb. And, and in, you know, sort of simple terms for the uninitiated, can you kind of start from the beginning um, and kind of explain what, um, what was going on and, and what led to um, you know, this decision, what the, what the factors were, what, you know, just sort of give a, a brief synopsis of your book. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I can do that and if we have two or three hours. And <laughs> yeah, we, we have some time, uh, yeah. Well, um, the, the context of the bomb, of course, is, is World War II and there are, are literally uh, thousands, probably tens of thousands of books written about World War II and, and, and for anyone um, who wants to understand the modern world it's essential to know something about World War II uh, whether you're a student or, or an adult um, and, and if you read anything about World War II it, it quickly becomes clear what a, what a horrendous, horrendous worldwide disaster that was for the world. I, I mean upwards of 80 million people died and the, the numbers are, are not exact but they're huge and, and, and impossible to get your, your arms around. Uh, the amount of destruction uh, in, in Europe and in other parts of the world was horrific um, and um, it, it's simply impossible to overstate uh, the destruction, the death and the horrors of, of, of the war. So in that context, um, once you understand that, and the, the war with Germany ended uh, in early May 1945, but the United States was still at war with Japan, and, the, and there were no prospects that the war with Japan was likely to end quickly or easily. Everyone knew that Japan was, was uh, in dire straits. The Japanese government certainly knew that. Uh, but Japan had given no indication at that point or for long afterwards in the summer of 1945 that they were ready to surrender. So even though they were defeated, uh, there was no sign that they were going to surrender. American policymakers were concerned that the war was going to last perhaps a year or more uh, with, uh, with huge uh, casualty lists for, for American soldiers and Marines and sailors. So the objective for Truman and his advisors in the summer of 1945 was to find a way to end the war as quickly as possible. Uh, and the atomic bomb, which was tested for the first time successfully uh, on, on July 16, 1945, uh, appeared to be the most promising way to end the war quickly. No one knew or no one um, assumed that it would end the war immediately, uh, but it appeared to be the, the, the best way, the most likely way to end the war most quickly, uh, and that's why it was used. So, so within that context, the, the, the horrors of the war uh, and, and the desire of Truman and his advisors to end the war as quickly as possible uh, 
The use of the bomb, which is so controversial now, was not at all controversial in, in, in the summer of 1945. It's not as though Truman had to choose between advisors who were saying one thing and advisors who were saying something else. No, it was obvious to everyone. The bomb might end the war quickly and might shock the Japanese into surrender, uh, and so we use it. Uh, there was no controversy. There was no real deliberation. Uh, once it was ready, uh, we were going to use it. Um, so if you're the 13-year-old, uh, I would urge you to, uh, to learn a little bit about, about World War II. Um, and, and, if you're, and, and once you do that, then I think you can understand uh, why the bomb was, I, I say in the book, an easy and obvious decision for Truman. Truman never agonized over using the bomb. Uh, he, 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 it was just an obvious decision. We've got it. Japanese are not ready to surrender, have given no indication that they're ready to surrender, and so we use it. And, and, and if, you know, if it, if it does what we think it's going to do, uh, it might shock them into surrendering. Um, Can you talk a little bit about um, the other bombing that was going on with conventional bombs on Japan? Yeah, and we kind of lose sight of that. Uh, um, since the B-29s had been developed, and the B-29 was the latest in in, in air, airplanes and air warfare uh, in late 1944, early 1945. Uh, the B-29s had bombed the smithereens out of Japan uh, since early in the year because the B-29 had enough range to reach Japan from the Marianas Islands that we had, had, um, had uh, taken over uh, in 1944. Uh, and made it possible for a B-29 to make a round trip from uh, Japanese, uh, from uh, Saipan uh, or Guam uh, to Japanese cities and, and back again, and that was something new. So, so starting in the summer, excuse me, starting in the fall, especially in, in the early months of 1945, uh, huge fleets of B-29s uh, bombed, in most cases, or at least many cases, firebombed Japanese cities and caused just enormous, enormous destruction. Uh, there's a photograph in my book of, of, of what happened to Tokyo. There was a firebombing of Tokyo in March of 1945 uh, that wiped out uh, huge sections of the city of Tokyo. And if you look at, at that photograph or, or any photograph, uh, it looks like the atomic bomb hit. I mean, it looks like the, the, the photos of, of, of damage from the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, um, so bombing of cities and bombing of civilians was a well-established practice for the United States um, and, and of course it had been in Europe too. Uh, there was nothing revolutionary about the use of atomic bomb against civilian uh, targets. Um, and, and this was viewed as unfortunate by Truman and especially by Secretary of War Henry Stimson uh, but it was also viewed as necessary to win the war as quickly as possible. So, so that's another reason why, um, why the decision to use the bomb for Truman was no big decision. It, it was just a bigger bomb. Uh, it was going to cause uh, extensive damage by using a, a single bomb. Um, but it was not a big step in terms of the power, in terms of the enormity of the destruction it caused from sending threats fleets of 300 or 350 B-29s against Japanese cities. So at the time you said that uh, Japan was all but defeated. Can you talk about where they were in terms of military um, abilities or strength and then why they didn't uh, surrender? Uh, Japan was in dire straits. Japan's uh, once proud air force uh, was, was reduced to uh, pretty much to training planes. The pilots who had been so skilled uh, were, were, were mostly um, no longer around, either killed or, or captured, most of them killed. So, so the air force was, was a shell of what had, it, it had been when they bombed Pearl Harbor. Uh, the, the, the Japanese Navy, another source of great pride, of course, uh, for the Japanese, was, was virtually eliminated in terms of fighting ability. Um, Japan was, was suffering from a, a very effective blockade that uh, 
the American Navy uh, had uh, mounted against the Japanese islands. It was also uh, um, affected greatly, of course, by the, uh, by the bombings of, of Japanese cities. Uh, the Japanese army um, was pretty much intact in China. China, uh, China ha had been overrun, or parts of China had been overrun, of course, by the Japanese in the late 1930s. So there were huge numbers of Japanese troops, uh, well-trained uh, Japanese troops, well-armed uh, and well-rested, for, for that matter, Japanese troops in China, other parts of Southeast Asia, and some of the Pacific Islands that had been bypassed. Uh, when the United States uh, hopscotched islands in the Pacific to get closer to Japan proper. So, so it, it had an army, but the army was isolated, or the armies of, 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 of Japan were isolated. Uh, the Japanese had a large number of troops in Manchuria, which they had, had overrun after 1931, uh, and, uh, and they had a fair number of, of soldiers and a fair number, I don't know the numbers, but. But, but, but a large number, too, would defend the homeland. It's just that those troops were not the best equipped, the best trained, um, the most experienced. So, so in terms of its ability to fight the war, Japan was, um, was, was severely uh, hampered, fatally hampered. Uh, and the Japanese government knew that. Why didn't they surrender? Well, they should have. Uh, as early as the summer of, of 1944, uh, when the United States uh, took over Saipan, uh, Japanese officials, and I've forgotten which official, a high Japanese official, said we can no longer conduct this war with any chance of success. So they knew that, uh, and there was no, no, no dissent about that. So they knew that uh, as early as the summer of, of 1944, but it took them another year to decide to surrender. Um, and, and there are, are, are various reasons for that. These were not stupid people, but they acted stupidly. Uh, and that might be the most important reason, but, but probably not. Um, they, uh, they wanted to make certain that when they surrendered, if they surrendered, that it was done in a way that would uh, be the, the, as, as, as painless as possible. And above all, they were determined to keep the emperor on the throne uh, as the head of and the symbol of the Japanese government. Um, and so the question becomes, what does it take to force the Japanese? The question becomes for the United States, for Truman and his advisors, uh, what does it take to force the Japanese to surrender? And how many uh, American lives is, is it going to cost to do that? Uh, and that was very much an open question throughout the fall and winter of, of 1944 and, 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 and the winter and spring and summer of, of 1945, and, and um, there were high officials within the Japanese government who said, look, we, we have to surrender. We can't, we can't fight this war. We can't win this war. Our people are being slaughtered. Um, you know, we have to end the war because, because if we don't, uh, continuing the war might be the greatest threat to the emperor. I mean, it wasn't, oh, they, they were saying, oh, we're losing, you know, tens of thousands of, of people, women and children. Uh, it, it's we have to do what we have to do to save the emperor and surrendering uh, with the condition that the emperor be allowed to remain on the throne uh, seems like the best way to do that. Others, the militants were saying, no, no, we can't do that. We're not going to surrender unless, and, and, and this came later, this came in, in, in the summer of 45, unless other conditions are met. Yeah, we have to keep the emperor on his throne. Uh, we also are not going to agree to um, to uh, an occupation of most areas of Japan. Uh, we want to disarm ourselves. We want to conduct our own uh, war crime trials. All kinds, well, there were four conditions, those four conditions, and, um, and they were totally unacceptable, of course, to the United States and, and its allies. It was, it was um, ridiculous for the militants to even think that they might be acceptable. But, but, but their thought was, if the United States uh, invades, fine. Um, and I should go back to to uh, uh, to American plans for an invasion. An invasion was was the was the least desirable by far, uh, and the most uh, feared way of defeating Japan. But the plans went forward as they had to because uh, most 
Military leaders, including the Army Chief of Staff, General George Marshall, were convinced that an invasion of Japan was going to be necessary to force the Japanese surrender. So plans went forward for an invasion of Japan uh, to begin on or around November 1st, 1945. The militants within the Japanese government were saying, um, yeah, let them come. We are going to kill so many of them when they invade that, uh, that they will um, uh, uh, reduce their, their, their surrender terms, that they will make it easier or more acceptable uh, for us to surrender. So, so that's the plan. Let them invade. Uh, sure, it's going to cost millions of Japanese lives, and they, and, and they use those numbers. Yes, it's going to cost uh, you know, 80 million, I think, was a number that was thrown around, a, a, a very large number of Japanese lives. But that's okay, because that way we can keep the emperor and we can uh, make uh, a surrender, we can make defeat uh, acceptable. So, so those were the two points of view that were being uh, uh, argued about within the Japanese government and, and the J Japanese hierarchy in the summer of 1945. Uh, and, and no conclusion had been reached, and the emperor couldn't make up his mind. I, I mean, he would kind of say one day, well, yes, peace would be a good idea, uh, let's try for that. And the next day he would say, well, maybe we should mount a new offensive in China, which, which he did say, in fact, uh, in July of 1945. Um, so, so that was the situation. You had a Japanese government, which knew it was defeated, but wasn't willing to uh, surrender. Uh, and that was determined at the minimum uh, to keep the emperor uh, on his throne. Um, and the indications are that the idea was not to keep the emperor on his throne as a constitutional monarch, as kind of a, a figurehead, but to keep the emperor on his throne with divine powers or the, the powers of a divine monarch, which is what he had before and during the war, of course, and this, again, was totally unacceptable to the U.S. This, this was never spelled out, but, but, but a lot of good scholarship uh, indicates that that's what they had in mind uh, up, until, um, up until the final s surrender terms were agreed to uh, by the Japanese and, and the United States after the two bombs and after the Soviet invasion of Manchuria. So tell us about, since you mentioned the Soviet invasion, um, go back to uh, the agreements that the Soviet were going to invade and what the U.S. attitudes toward having the Soviets come in were initially and then how that changed and Jimmy Burns' fears and all of this. How's this? Yeah. Um, the, 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 the one, one major objective of Roosevelt at Yalta, which was in January of 1945, was to get um, Stalin to agree to enter the war against Japan. The Soviets, of course, had been fighting the, the Nazis, and um, and that had been uh, been all that they could do uh, as long as as a war in Europe was going on. Um, but by January of 1945, it was clear that the Nazis were all but defeated, and Roosevelt wanted an agreement from Stalin to enter the war against Japan. Japan and Russia had signed a non-aggression pact in. I'm not sure if it was 1939 or 40, but, but sometime uh, early in the war. They were both in the war by that time. Sorry, that's not right. What is right is Japan and, and Russia had signed a non-aggression agreement, which, which both countries had observed because it was in their interest to do so. So what Roosevelt wanted Stalin to do was to agree to come in to the uh, war against Japan uh, and Stalin agreed to do that three months after the war in Europe was ended. Uh, and the reason that Roosevelt was so anxious to have that happen is that, uh, is that the, the Russians could tie down the Japanese troops in Manchuria, of which there were many, tie down those troops uh, so that they wouldn't be able to be transferred back to mainland Japan. And, and, and the blockade in, in January was not as tight as it was um, later in the spring and summer, but 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 the idea was to get the Soviets to uh, to tie down those Japanese troops in Manchuria, and of course for Stalin it was a good deal because he would not only tie down Japanese troops but he would increase his power in uh, in in uh, in Asia. So that was the agreement, and um, and that was the thinking, uh, and and. Uh, American policymakers were clear that um, 
you know, having the Soviets invade Manchuria would be very helpful uh, for ending the war successfully. They did not say, and I, I haven't found any place where anyone ever said that uh, a Soviet invasion of Manchuria in itself would be enough to cause the Japanese to surrender. Um, and so the objective for Roosevelt, and when Truman went to Potsdam in July of 1945, uh, his main objective, and he states this in his diary very clearly, uh, the main objective was to uh, get Stalin to reaffirm his commitment to, to entering the war against Japan uh, the following month, because the war in, in, in Europe had ended in, uh, in May, and so Stalin was due to enter in August early August, and Truman's first meeting with Stalin was an informal luncheon, uh, and Stalin said, yes, you know, that's what he was going to do, and Truman was delighted because, you know, he'd gotten the main thing that he had gone to Potsdam for without any hassle. Uh, Truman said, or Stalin said, excuse me, Stalin said, yeah, I'll, I'll be in August 15th. Uh, and Truman was, uh, I think, ecstatic, would not uh, overstate how he felt. And, um, uh, I mean, Stalin didn't do it as a favor. Of course, he had his own, own, own reasons for wanting to invade Manchuria, but still, for, for Truman, that was a big thing. Um, but the documents at the time also make clear that although uh, the U.S. thought this would be helpful, again, no one thought it was enough in itself. Truman made a, a famous diary entry where, where he, he, he wrote down some notes after his luncheon with Stalin, and he says, Finney Japs when that comes about. And some scholars have said, well, here's proof that Truman thought that, you know, Soviet invasion would be enough to, uh, to defeat Japan, and so we didn't need to bomb. Um, and, and I'm convinced that we don't know exactly what Truman meant. It's something he jotted down. It's not as though he thought about it. Uh, it's absolutely clear that he, he wasn't hearing that from his military advisors, from Marshall or from Stimson or from anybody else who, who was in charge of conducting the war, that a Soviet invasion in itself would, uh, would, would, would be enough to defeat Japan. Um, you know, later on, I, with, with Japanese documents and, and, and with magic intercepts, the United States was intercepting Japanese diplomatic traffic. Um, so we have more sources than, than, than we once did and, and have for the last 20 years or so. Um, it, it's possible that the United States underestimated the, the impact of, of the Soviet invasion on Japan uh, and that the impact was greater than what American policymakers thought at the time in the summer of 1945. But, but clearly th at that time, in, in the context in which they were operating, uh, they did not believe that the Soviet invasion in itself was, was, was going to, to be enough. They thought it would be helpful, it, it would put more pressure on the Japanese, it would, it, it would be a shock to the Japanese, uh, but they certainly didn't conduct or, or make their policy uh, on the assumption that once the Soviets entered the war, that the war would end very soon after that. And did you ask me another part of that question? Oh, just uh, <coughs> James Burns, who was... Oh, Burns, yeah. Burns uh, was, was convinced that the bomb was going to help him uh, negotiate with the Soviet. Tensions were already growing between the United States and the Soviet Union, and, and they had been for throughout 1945, e even before Roosevelt died. Roosevelt was concerned about about what Stalin was doing in Eastern Europe, and, and that was a major, major issue. It was the defining issue um, in, in the post-war world, uh, in, in the post-war uh, in Europe world, uh, and, and so tensions were growing, and, and Burns was concerned about, about how this was going to affect American um, positions and American uh, goals in Europe as, as well as in Asia. So, so Burns um, made it very clear that, that he thought that having the bomb, this is after July 16th, the bomb has been successfully tested, uh, that this was going to help him um, intimidate or at least impress the Soviets uh, at the diplomatic table. Um, it, it's not clear to me, and, and I don't think any scholars have really gone to the next step, uh, and I'm not sure there's any way to go to the next step.
it's, it's not clear to me how he thought that would work. I, I mean, if he was going to wave the bomb and say, hey, you know, you better back down because we've got the bomb, um, and, and, and that's, that's perhaps a non-issue. But, but Burns clearly thought that, and, and he talked to Truman about that, at least some, and, and Truman's attitude was kind of, oh yeah, fine, if that's, you know, if they do that, fine, fine. But, um, but that's not the reason that the bomb was used. Uh, the bomb was used for military reasons because Truman was hearing from his military advisors and Burns was not a military advisor uh, in, in any uh, sense of the term. Um, Can you remind people who, who he was? Oh, Burns was, by, by Potsdam, he was the Secretary of State. Um, yes, for that 13-year-old in, uh, in the, in the, in the Midwest. James F. Burns was, was the Secretary of State, so, so that's why, I mean, he was in charge of diplomacy. Uh, but he was not a military advisor, and, um, and and the reason that Truman used the bomb was that he heard from his military advisors that that it might end the war more quickly. So, mil by military advisors, you mean George C. Marshall, and who, who was involved in this? Well. Uh, the key advisors were Admiral Leahy, who was the White House Chief of Staff, uh, William D., I think is his, his middle initial, William Leahy, um, uh, George C. Marshall, who was the Army Chief of Staff, uh, a, a man who commanded enormous respect from Truman and from everybody, uh, and, and Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson, uh, a man of uh, enormous uh, gravity and uh, dignity who was respected by everybody. Truman didn't have a great deal of affection, or at least he wasn't close to Stimson, but he listened to Stimson. Uh, so, so those were the top three who were advising him on military decisions and military actions. Um, um, Truman, of course, was, was, was uh, a former officer, so, so he had some, some sense of, of military um, uh, he had military experience, and, and that, that was uh, of value to him as well. Can you tell us a, a little more about uh, Stimson, uh, what, because of, of um, would you say that he was the one who was close, most closely involved with the actual development of the atomic bomb? Yes, Truman, uh, excuse me, Stimson, um, Stimson was the Secretary of War, so, so he was the one who made decisions. W once, once the Manhattan Project was authorized, uh, which it was in um, fall of 1941, then, then Stimson was the, was the top official who was responsible for, uh, for the, the conduct for the, um, for the actions of the Manhattan Project, and of course he appointed General Groves, who was the, who was the, the boot on the ground uh, the, uh, in terms of, 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 of running the Manhattan Project. Uh, but, but Stimson was, was the one who was, 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 was the highest official who was on top of the Manhattan Project on a day-to-day -day basis, who, who really uh, uh, understood what was going on without knowing all the technical details. He was, he, he, he was certainly keenly aware of progress uh, on, on the Manhattan Project and, and what it meant. Uh, and by early 1945, when it was clear that the bomb was going to be, uh, uh, was, was going to be built uh, and, and likely to be successful, scientists were, were, were telling Stimson and, and had told, uh, Groves had told Roosevelt uh, that the uranium bomb, the U-235 bomb, which was used against um, Hiroshima, wouldn't need any testing. Uh, they were so certain it would work. So, so it was clear by early 1945 that, 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 that we would have a bomb, because by then it was clear that you're going to have enough U-235 to build at least one bomb. And, and Stimson got, got, got very um, concerned about what this meant for the post-war world in terms of American-Soviet relations uh, especially. Uh, and, and so Stimson w was, was, was very thoughtful about what this means and what the overall impact is going to be, what the long-term impact is going to be, uh, and what, what is going to happen uh, you know, if and, and after the bomb is used. Um, 
And, and, and at first he said, well, I mean, he said things that were similar to Burns's view. Uh, you know, this, this is going to help us with the Russians kind of thing. This, 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 this is going to be, and I should know the quote, and I, I don't have it at my fingertips, this is going to be the master weapon. This is going to be the, the uh, decisive weapon. Um, and, and, and again, it was kind of vague about, about how, but the, but the fact that we would have this powerful new weapon and, and nobody else would, uh, would be helpful in um, dealing with the Russians. As time went on, he became more concerned about, about what that meant, and, and, and he was very uh, concerned that Truman was overreacting to, to, to what the Soviets were doing in Eastern Europe, and that, and, and, and that, um, that things did not have to be uh, so tense with the Russians that we couldn't get along with them. And, and he kind of factored the bomb into his thinking. And, and by, by a month or so after the war ended, he, was, he, he changed his views enough that he was recommending to Truman that we approach the Russians, offer to share basic scientific information, not, not the engineering details on how to build the bomb, but basic scientific information about atomic energy as, as, as a way to, to try to win their trust. Uh, so that was a big change from his views five or six months earlier. So, so Stimson was well informed, he was thoughtful, uh, and he was concerned about what the advent of the bomb meant, but he also was convinced that it should be used, it should be used as quickly as possible against Japan, that it was the most likely uh, way to end the war as quickly as possible. So can you talk about how many of them, uh, well maybe we should go on with the story then chronologically, so we're now, um, we have the Japanese, it's sort of a stalemate, among their advisors, or at least there's no sign that people want to, are willing to admit defeat or accept the terms. Um, what impact did the bomb, let's say, did the first one have? And can you talk about how the Japanese responded to the bombs? Yeah, um, from the evidence we have, and, and, and the evidence is ambiguous and there's still a lot of controversy, but, but scholars who, who, who I respect uh, and who've looked at, at Japanese sources um, are convinced uh, that it was Hiroshima that finally convinced the emperor that the time had come to surrender. Uh, it didn't mean that he was ready to surrender on one condition, uh, or only one condition. Uh, he was still apparently talking about, yeah, we should surrender, but, but, but maybe the militants are right. You know, we should ask for four conditions. But at least and, and this is exceedingly important, at least it, it, it convinced the emperor that the time had come to surrender. We couldn't continue uh, any longer. And, and uh, you can make a, a case, I think, that the emperor reached that decision because, because the atomic bomb looked like it might be a major threat to his own, pardon the expression, rear end, uh, without, without being, uh, well, it is disrespectful because I'm not sure he, the emperor should have ended the war a lot sooner, but, 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 but Hiroshima finally convinced him that the time had come to, to end the war. Um, and that was critical because the emperor had vacillated for years. He knew that the conditions were not good. We don't know exactly how much he, he knew about how bad things were, but, 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 but he had a sense. Uh, I mean, he could see the, uh, he did see the destruction that the firebombing had caused in Tokyo in, in March. Um, so, uh, so the first bomb was absolutely um, essential, uh, the absolute key to convincing the emperor that time for vacillation had ended, we, we have to end the war. Um, do you want me to go on to the yeah. second yes, bomb? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, please. Um, it did not convince the militants. Uh, and, and, and so the, 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 the Japanese government was still paralyzed. And the emperor did, did, did something um, unusual, is that he went before uh, the Japanese cabinet and more important, a, a special body called the Supreme Council for the duration, for, for the direction, excuse me, for the direction of the war, which was evenly split between, um, and, and, and were the highest officials in, in, in the government, uh, or um, at least in, on, on the military side. 
uh, and it was evenly split between uh, those who thought Japan should surrender on the basis that the emperor's throne, uh, that, that the emperor remain on his throne, uh, and those who said, no, we have to hold out, and if they invade, find the militants. <coughs> so um, after some time, and it took a couple of days to find out what had happened at Hiroshima, and, and uh, but but it was the day after um, Hiroshima was bombed on the sixth. The day after, on the seventh, late in the day, um, Hirohito got the Emperor of Japan got the word that Japan had been that excuse me that Hiroshima had been uh, uh, destroyed by a single bomb, and it was at that point that he said, "Okay, the war has to end." The next day, there there was a meeting that he held with, um, with Tojo, the foreign minister who was a member of the peace faction, and, and, and he made it clear that, that, um, you know, that I want the war to end on unacceptable terms. And, and it wasn't until the next day uh, that there was a meeting of the Supreme Council mm -hmm. for the direction of the war, and the emperor made an appearance, and, and he said, I, I think the war has to end. He listened to the, the arguments on, on both sides, and he said the war has to end. Um, and there was a lot of opposition uh, from the uh, from from the militants, um, but but the the decision was made finally that that um, that the United States would be approached uh, for uh, for an end of the war on the condition that the emperor be allowed to remain on his throne. So so that was the key. Uh, but 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 meantime, uh, even even while this was going on, while while Japan was trying to decide what to do, and the emperor was was um, was 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 becoming convinced that the war had to end, um, uh, Russia in, in, Russia invaded Manchuria, and, and and this was the second great shock. I mean, the first shock was, was Hiroshima. The second great shock was, was the Soviet invasion. And, and this c did come as a huge um, setback for the militants. Um, and, and it's not exactly clear exactly why it was such a shock, because the Soviets had been mobilizing on the borders for months, and the Japanese knew that. Uh, some of the military thought they wouldn't invade for another few months. Um, and, and others uh, s simply apparently didn't believe it. Um, it, it. It was not an exercise in, um, in, in, uh, in very uh, prescient uh, analysis of what was going on and what, what was facing Japan. But, but the Soviets invaded on, uh, on August 9th, um, overran Japanese troops in, in Manchuria uh, very quickly, and, and, and a very costly way in terms of Japanese lives. Uh, so suddenly the Japanese government was faced not only with the atomic bomb, but also with the Soviet invasion of Manchuria. And as I indicated earlier, um, this is probably more of a shock than, than, than American leaders realized. Uh, and so the combination of the two finally convinced the Japanese that they had to surrender on, on the sole condition uh, that the emperor be retained. Um, and, and historians argue about which is more important, and some say, oh, the atomic bomb wasn't important at all, it was the Soviet invasion, some say it was atomic bomb, and the Soviet invasion was, was not very important. Most scholars now say it's a combination of two and you can't possibly sort out which was more important. But, but it seems clear to me that the atomic bomb was, 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 was the most important factor in convincing the emperor. Uh, and that was a crucial step. So some combination, and, and, and it, it certainly varied from person to person, which was more important, which one made a single individual decide that, you know, we, that Japan had to surrender. Um, so uh, August 9th then, um, um, August 9th or August 10th? After that meeting, which was August 9th, then the Japanese send a message through Switzerland to the United States, we're willing to surrender if, if the emperor remains on his throne and it was stated in there, and if he, and I, I've forgotten the phrase, but it meant he, or, or could be read to, uh, to mean, and, and almost certainly meant, uh, if he retains his power as a divine monarch. 
which, which uh, I mean, it was great news that the Japanese sent a message that they were willing to surrender, but there was great concern about what this meant. And so, and so uh, Truman gets this and he has a meeting with his top advisors and everyone's saying, great, the Japanese are ready to surrender and let the emperor remain, you know, as a constitutional monarch kind of thing. And, and Burns, who had been hearing this from his State Department experts, said, wait a minute, wait a minute, uh, you know, we can't have this because this, uh, this could leave uh, the emperor on his throne with all the powers that he has now, which, which, uh, which is why we got into war in the first place. And, and Burns was also concerned about the, uh, the political impact of allowing the Japanese to surrender with a condition because uh, Pol showed after Hiroshima by, by two to one or more that, that, that those Americans who were, who were interviewed said, no, we shouldn't allow the Japanese any conditions. You know, get the emperor out of there. Try him as a war criminal, you know, hang him, uh, kind of thing. So, so Burns was concerned, as Burns always was, about the political effects. So, so Truman says, okay, Jimmy, um, you know, you go and draft something that will, uh, that will um, solve this problem. <laughs> and of course it was a very delicate problem because we certainly wanted the Japanese to surrender. What we did not want uh, was the emperor to remain as a cons constitutional monarch. And, and the, um, the, the telegram that was sent back, or the message that was sent back to Japan in response to its peace offer was very vague uh, about the emperor's status. And it caused a new crisis in Japan because the militants were saying, no, this is not acceptable. Uh, and, and, and it finally uh, required the advice of Hirohito's closest advisors. Uh, closest advisor, his name was Kido, Lord Keeper of the Privy Seal, which I'm not sure exactly what that means and it doesn't sound uh, uh, all that imposing, but, uh, but, 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 but Quito was a boyhood friend of the emperor and, and his closest advisor. And Quito was, was convinced the war had to end. Um, so he convinced uh, Hirohito to, to appear again before the Supreme Council for the direction of the war and appeal again for peace. Um, and that did it. Uh, the uh, Japanese agreed to surrender uh, on the sole condition that the emperor uh, be retained, and, 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 and the terminology did not say constitutional monarch, but there was nothing in there about him retaining the prerogatives of his office as there was before. Uh, and on that basis then uh, the war ended. But it was a very, very close call and it was a very, very um, iffy thing. And, and, and one, one argument has been made, and I, I find it wonderfully uh, convincing, and, and, and the scholar who's made this argument is Richard Frank. Um, and, and Richard makes the argument, going back to the, uh, emperor, the, the atomic bomb versus the Soviet invasion, he, he, he says uh, uh, that, 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 that the bomb was essential to convince Hirohito to surrender, um, but that it was the Soviet invasion that convinced the generals of all those armies in China and other parts of East Asia to surrender because it was genuine concern both among American officials and Japanese officials uh, that the emperor's order to surrender would not be obeyed by by generals in East Asia who had huge armies and who have could have, who could have have fought on for a very long time uh, at, at enormous cost uh, to to everybody uh, and, and Richard makes the argument that that once the Soviets came in. Uh, then the generals out in the field who were outraged by the idea of, 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 of surrendering. But once the Soviets came in, then they, they, they knew they couldn't defeat the Soviets. So they went along with it. It's, it, it's a very uh, interesting argument of, uh, that, that, that I think makes a very sensible separation of what the impact of the bomb was uh, and the impact of the, the Soviet invasion. <coughs> well, that was excellent. Um, and one thing I, I was, um, which you could talk about a little bit, is this backdoor negotiations that the Japanese were pursuing with the Soviets for uh, sort of almost um, unbelievably that they would be approaching the Soviets who had their own uh, desires to, to enter the war and, and maybe take a piece of some of the 
things they had lost in the Frank uh, in the, the 1905 wars. Right. And, you know. So at any rate, so that there was other things going on. You mentioned Switzerland. You know, there were uh, U.S. channels there. There were Soviet channels there. There were lots of different uh, signals being sent to Russia from Russia. So, I mean, Soviets. Yeah, there, 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 there were almost none of it was authorized. I mean, I, I mean, there were some Japanese officials in Sweden and, and Switzerland who were saying, well, you know, we we might surrender. Our government m might surrender if if the unconditional surrender, which is what what was U.S. policy at the time, was modified to keep the emperor. But 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 those are not authorized approaches at all. It's not as though these these officials had any and any. Um, approval to do that. Um, the, 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 um, the emperor did decide in, in, in response to the um, peace faction, so-called peace faction within the Japanese government, and the militants went along to approach the Soviets, this is in June of, of 1945, to approach the Soviets in hopes, uh, in, in hopes that, the, um, that the Soviets would mediate a peace settlement between Japan and the United States, um, and, and it was a futile hope. The only reason it was done was it was the one thing that uh, that uh, the faction that wanted to surrender and those who wanted to fight on could agree on. Um, so, so an envoy was sent to uh, Russia, and the uh, Japanese ambassador, his name was Sato, and, and Sato and. Tojo, who was the uh, foreign minister of, of, of Japan, exchanged a lot of, of, of telegrams in July of 1945, trying to figure out what to do with Soviets and how this was going to work. And, and Sato, who I don't know much about, but 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 was obviously had his feet on the ground, and, and he was saying to Tojo, who was his friend, but but he, he was saying, you know, look. Look, if you people want me to approach the Soviets, you have to tell me on what basis we're willing to surrender. And Tojo um, didn't know because the Japanese couldn't agree on anything. And Sato was saying, um, you know, at, at, at one point, um, Tojo must have mentioned something about the four conditions that the militants were talking about. And Sato kind of knocked his hand against his forehead and said, you know, that's impossible. You know, no one's going to accept that. The only thing that we possibly might have a chance for, you know, if things go well, if, you know, if we're lucky and if we're good, the only thing we can possibly get as a condition is that the emperor remains on his throne. So, so those kinds of wires were going back between uh, Moscow and Tokyo and being intercepted and read in the United States. And, and those exchanges between um, two high-level officials, um, both of whom favored a surrender, uh, made it clear that the Japanese were not ready to surrender. Uh, there's, there's a famous wire, July 16th, that, that Tojo sent to Sato saying, saying, well, it appears that the main obstacle surrender to, to surrender is the Allies' demand for un unconditional surrender. Uh, and some scholars have, have said this is, this is proof that the Japanese were ready to surrender if only we modified the formula for unconditional surrender. Um, and, and that, that um, telegram or that message was intercepted and um, General Marshall gave it to his chief of intelligence whose name was Weckerling. John, John Weckerling was a general who had spent a lot of time in Japan uh, uh, two terms of office, three, two or three years apiece as a military attaché, so he knew Japan. So, so Marshall says to, to Weckerling, you know, what does this mean, you know? Tojo, the foreign minister, is saying that, you know, Japan might surrender if, uh, or, or that the main obstacle surrender is our demand for unconditional surrender. And, and Weckerling said, well, you know, it could mean that the emperor has intervened in favor of surrender, but this, the chances of that are, are remote. It, it, it is possible that uh, that 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 the, the the peace faction in Japan has triumphed, but we know from other evidence that you know that's not the case, or at least all indications are that that's not the case. And it's possible that this is a ploy by the Japanese to appeal to appeal to war weariness uh, 
in the United States, and that seems the most likely. Uh, so, so clearly, American officials did not view this message from, from Tojo to Sato as proof that if only we had modified unconditional surrender, the Japanese would have quit the war. Uh, clearly, they weren't ready to do that. Um, so it's an interesting, it, it's one of those documents, uh, which, which is rare in historical research, but it's one of those documents, you, you, you read it and you say, hey, you know, this, this really convinces me or changes minds because it's clear. One of the arguments of the revisionists who, who claim that the war could have ended as quickly or, or, or more quickly uh, if we had uh, offered to modify unconditional surrender. Um, and one of their arguments is that the Japanese were, were, were ready to surrender and that the United States knew it. Well, the Weckerling memo makes it clear that the United States did not know it. In fact, it was far con uh, from convinced, with good reason, that the Japanese uh, were not ready to surrender. So you mentioned the revisionists. Can you tell us a little bit about who, who are these historians? Uh, tell do, us about that. Do you want me to name names? Or well, I don't know. <laughs> Whatever you think is... is oh, well, there... You know, uh, this has been an enormous controversy. The, the, the decision to use the bomb uh, is, is I, I think, in, t in, in terms of longevity and in terms of, of bitterness, uh, uh, the most controversial issue in American history. And, and, and there are basically two arguments. One is a traditional argument that, that most of us of a certain age grew up with, uh, and which was set forth by Truman and Stimson and others after the war that the president faced a, a decision, a difficult decision, uh, between on the one hand uh, authorizing the use of the atomic bomb and on the other hand uh, authorizing an invasion of Japan that was going to cost hundreds of thousands of American lives. And that's the traditional interpretation. The revisionists say that's completely wrong, uh, that Japan had decided to surrender, that it was trying desperately to surrender on the sole and reasonable um, uh, condition that the emperor be allowed to remain on his throne, and they don't say this, but, but presumably as a constitutional monarch, uh, and therefore that the, the traditional interpretation is wrong, the bomb was not necessary to end the war, uh, and that it was totally unnecessary, and that it was used for some other reason, uh, and the reason it is cited most often is to intimidate the Soviets, and this is where they, they bring in Burns as playing a major role in. And, um, and, and the use of the bomb to, uh, to, to use it as a diplomatic weapon against the Soviet Union. <coughs> Excuse me. So those are the, the, the positions, and as I argue, and a lot of others argue, I'm certainly not alone, uh, they're both seriously flawed. Uh, the traditional view, because one, Truman did not start, did, did not face a stark choice between the bomb and an invasion. The invasion was not going to, uh, to begin until on or around November 1st. Um, and a lot could, could, have happened, could have happened between August and, and November of 1945. Um, and also the view that if an invasion had been necessary, it would have cost hundreds of thousands of lives. Uh, there's simply no contemporaneous evidence that, that, that supports that argument. It was made after the war as a means to justify the use of the bomb against uh, a, a, a really small number of critics who in the late 40s, early 50s were saying that perhaps the bomb wasn't necessary. Um, so, um, and, and it's also beyond, beyond question that the use of the bomb, excuse me, that the invasion was not inevitable. I mean, the idea that Truman had to, had, to, had, had to use a bomb because if he didn't, the only other option was, uh, was an invasion is simply wrong. So, so the traditional view in its pure form that Truman used a bomb to uh, avoid an invasion uh, simply doesn't hold up. In the view of the revisionists? Uh, no, in, in the view of those of us who are somewhere in between. And, and what I argue uh, is that Truman used the bomb for the reasons he said he did, to end the war as quickly as possible. And, and, and no one told him, no one in a position of authority or knowledge, uh, and certainly not his chief of military advisors, told him in the summer of 1945 
that if you don't use the bomb, an invasion is inevitable and it's, it's going to cost hundreds of thousands of lives. Estimates for, for, for lives lost that, 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 that were projected by military experts in the summer of 1945 were, were far less than that, and the, the numbers uh, are, 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 are far from hard evidence. Uh, but there's no evidence whatsoever that he was ever told that hundreds of thousands of lives would be the cost of an invasion of Japan, and that was something that came about later. But my argument is um, that Truman didn't have to be told uh, that uh, that an invasion would cost hundreds of thousands of lives. If uh, he knew it was going to cost a lot of lives, tens of thousands. Um, if an invasion was necessary, a and he also knew that even uh, without an invasion, the war was still going on. Uh, Okinawa had been defeated in late June of 1945, so we have one month when there weren't any major battlefronts between the end of the, the Battle of Okinawa and the end of the war, which is July 1945. And in that month, uh, about 775 American soldiers and Marines were killed in combat. About another 23 or 2,400 were killed in, um, from, from other, or, or, or died from other causes. Disease, you know, wounds, accidents, whatever. So, so you had 3,000 soldiers and Marines who were killed in the month of July of 1945 without any major battlefronts. And you also had, had sailors being killed. Uh, the sinking of the USS Indianapolis occurred July 28, 1945, just a horrific um, event in, in, which, in which a Japanese submarine a, a, attacked and, and sank the USS Indianapolis. Uh, and of the 1,100 crew members, 880 died either from the explosion of the trip or they were um, stranded in, in, in the water for, uh, for a very long time uh, and, and either died from exposure or from sharks. Uh, just a, a horrific story. And, and as long as a war was going on, that was going to happen. And that's what Truman and his advisors were concerned about. No one had to tell them that, uh, that the alternative to using the bomb was, losing, was, was, was saving hundreds of thousands of lives, saving far fewer lives. And, and that number of, of 32 or 3,300 who died in, in, in July, and that's just soldiers and sailors, so, uh, soldiers and Marines, so you have sailors on top of that. Uh, that was plenty of reason to use the bomb if it uh, had a chance to end the war as quickly as possible. And, and I think people lose sight of the fact that, you know, the myth grew up after the war that, uh, that either use a bomb or, or, or you lose hundreds of thousands of lives in an invasion. And that understates and underestimates the commitment of Truman and his advisors to ending the war as quickly as possible to save any number of lives. And I, you know, when, when, when I give talks about this, I, I say, you know, imagine Truman and, and an advisor comes up to him and he says, Mr. President, you know, you can, you can lose, you, you can use the atomic bomb or the alternative is to lose uh, 40,000 American lives and, you know, use it. It's, it's easy. Mr. President, uh, you can use the a bomb or if you don't, you're going to lose an extra 10,000 American lives. Use it. Mr. President, you can use the bomb or the alternative is to lose an extra 1,000 American lives. Mr. President, uh, you can use the bomb or the alternative is to lose an extra 100 American lives. Mr. President, uh, you can use the bomb or the alternative is to lose an extra uh, 10 American lives. Well, maybe then I have to think about it. And, 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 and that's imaginary, but, 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 but I think it, 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 it captures what Truman's thinking was. And it would have been a very small number for, for him to say, uh, well, maybe we should think twice about this. Uh, and I, I don't know if Truman knew, no one knows if Truman knew how many soldiers and sailors and Marines died in the, in, in the month of July. But Truman could pick up any newspaper uh, from any city in the country and see pictures of soldiers and sailors and Marines who had died every day in the paper and see lists every day. And he certainly knew about that. And, and, and 
you know, it bothers me when, when, when people underestimate uh, Truman's commitment to ending the war uh, for exactly that reason. And, and, and the numbers are insignificant and they've been a, a, the, the cause of a whole lot of angry controversy among scholars. And, and, um, but, but, um, and it's interesting, but it's not, it's not decisive to know, um, you know what the estimates were. Uh, uh, what, what's important is to keep in mind that's what Truman cared about. And you say, and, and, and students have asked me and other, other people who, who have been in, in audiences, well, you know, 3,000 lives and how many lives did the atomic bomb cost? Well, you know, 166,000 or so in Hiroshima, another 80,000 or 100,000 in, in Nagasaki. And they say, well, how can he do that? Well, the fact is when you're at a war, or in a war, um, that you don't make those kinds of calculations. You know, that, that calculus is not done. The idea is to win the war, certainly for us in 1945, the idea is to win the war as quickly as possible and save as many lives as possible. And how many Japanese lives were cost or were assessed, or how many Japanese were lost by the atomic bomb was, was incidental. Um, and. Um, and, and, and that's the unfortunate, the, the, the tragic part of any, of any wartime situation. But, but when it comes to motives, uh, the motive was clearly to save every single one of those lives as possible by ending the war at the earliest possible moment, and the atomic bomb looked like the best way to do that. Uh, and and it's, it's terribly tragic. If you read about the effects of, of the bomb, it just breaks your heart. Um, but there, there, there's also the fact, and, and I think we lose sight of the fact, or some people lose sight of the fact, that, that the Japanese should have surrendered in, in 1944, and, and that they prolonged the war um, for reasons which, which seem to me to be um, illegitimate. Um, so, um, eh, one, one well-known uh, factor in this whole thing, <laughs> um, yeah, I need to keep my hands down. I mean, um, you know, when, when, when Secretary Stimson came in after Truman returned from Potsdam, this was on, um, he met with Truman the, the morning of, of August the 10th. Um, and he showed him, for the first time, there were photographs of, of the damage to Hiroshima. And Stimson said to Truman, you know, 100,000 people probably died. No one knew for certain, but, but the estimate that he gave to Truman was 100,000 lives were lost at, at Hiroshima. Uh, and that um, apparently, obviously, I think, had, had a major impact on uh, Truman because he went to a cabinet meeting later that day and uh, he was talking about the war and he said f for the first time he said uh, I have issued an order uh, that we will use no more atomic bombs without my express authorization which hadn't happened at, with, with, with the first two bombs um, and he said he, 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 he was greatly bothered by the, the fact of, 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 of that the bomb at Hiroshima had killed a, th a thousand, excuse me, a hundred thousand people. He was greatly bothered by the fact that that a hundred thousand people had died, and, and and he didn't like the idea of quote killing all those kids. Uh, so so uh, Truman, um, for the first time, became aware of of, of what the human impact of, of the bomb was, uh, and. Um, I think we all need to be aware of that, and, and, and yet, uh, I mean, we we keenly aware of that, and yet, yet we shouldn't lose sight of of, of what the motives were uh, in using the bomb. Yeah, I, I mentioned the, the weaknesses in the traditional ar ar argument, and I should also mention uh, the, the what I consider fatal weaknesses in the revisionist argument. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that, the, that, that, uh, that, that there's two central parts of the revision argument, and, and we know beyond a shadow of, uh, of a doubt that they're both incorrect. 
Uh, one is that the Japanese were trying to surrender, and uh, Japanese sources that have opened since uh, Hirohito died in 1989 make it abundantly clear that Japan, in fact, had not decided to surrender before Hiroshima. Uh, and scholars who have used Japanese, of which there are several who are very good, and, and who kind of span the spectrum of opinion on, on Truman's decision to use the bomb, but, but, but they all agree that Japan had not, had not decided to surrender. Uh, before Hiroshima. So that's one major element of the revisionist argument that simply doesn't hold up. And, and, and the other is, and, and I think I, I got waylaid when I, I started talking about the Weckerling memo and, 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 and how it's, it's one, one, one of those rare memos that really makes things clear that were uh, a source of controversy. And what it makes clear is that the United States government did not believe that Japan was ready to surrender. I mean, the, rev the revisionists have said, oh, you know, Japan had decided to surrender and that the U.S. knew that. Well, the Weckerling memo makes it abundantly clear that, in fact, the U.S. didn't know that and, and, and didn't believe that. Um, and, and there are other major problems with the uh, revisionist argument. They put much more emphasis on the feasibility of the war ending without the bomb um, by, um, by taking advantage of other alternatives, and I, I don't think I want to get into the other alternatives, but, uh, but the, the, the uh, m m most common argument is if only we had modified unconditional surrender, and they use that Tojo Mamu de Seto to say the Japanese, you know, if only we had modified that, the war would have ended. And, and, uh, and, and we know that that's not true now, and we know that the U.S. didn't, didn't believe that either. So. Um, so the two main um, mainstays, the two major mainstays of the revisionist argument uh, simply don't hold any water based on, on, on recent, uh, fairly recent, over the past 20 years, documents which have become available and some outstanding scholarship. So um, what, what, what is defensible and in fact is true about the re revisionist argument is, is that the impression of the Soviets was a part of the, the, the uh, motivation for the use of the bomb, but a secondary part, a bonus. Uh, the, the, uh, the primary reason was to end a war as quickly as possible. Uh, and, you know, if it impressed the Soviets, well, fine, great, that's, that's a nice little addition. Uh, and, and there were other reasons as well. To, to, you know, General Groves was concerned about about if the bomb didn't work or if it wasn't used, that how would he explain uh, what he had spent two billion dollars on? Uh, so, so there were those kinds of reasons. But, but uh, and and you know, hatred of the Japanese and vengeance and, and all those things played a role. Um, but but the primary reason was to get the war over, um, hopefully as as uh, as quickly as possible. So, so there are severe problems with both the traditional interpretation and the revisionist interpretation, and I and, and a lot of other very able scholars come out somewhere between. <laughs>